Sometimes you just get lucky. We happen to have right here the three most powerful muscle cars that you can buy in America today. In ascending order of horsepower, we have the Chevrolet Camaro ZL1, the Ford Mustang Shelby GT500, and the Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye. Between the three of them, they've got about 2,200 horsepower. Obviously a lot of power. We need to find somewhere to go take these things out, really cut them loose. So we're taking a Wild West road trip. Los Angeles all the way to Monument Valley, one of the most scenic, iconic locations in North America. Who knows how much longer cars like this are gonna be around. So we got four days to drive a whole lot of miles and make the most of it. The West, you know, we just sort of use it as an offhand term, but it's humongous. You know, we think about just sort of the West being this area, sort of everything to the left of the Mississippi on the map. But, you know, in reality, there's a whole bunch of different versions of it. We've decided to sort of focus down on the core of what people kind of think of as the West. Going from Los Angeles, driving all the way across California, going across Arizona, going all the way out to Monument Valley, uh, which is right on the Utah Arizona border and then driving back to Las Vegas and then back to Los Angeles which sounds super easy but it's actually like 1200 miles because everything out here is way freaking far apart from each other I took up the lead behind the reins of the Mustang while Sean stayed close behind me in the Camaro All right so the new 2020 I think it's formally called the Ford Mustang Shelby GT500, which is a very awkward name. No one's gonna call it that. They just call it the Shelby GT500. So this new sixth generation Ford Mustang version of this is basically a supercar disguised as a muscle car. 760 horsepower, 625 pound-feet of torque. This thing is practically a Ferrari 812, but just happens to be made by Ford. So under the hood, basically they take the block of the Shelby GT350, so it's a 5.2 liter V8. This one is supercharged. They play around with it. 2.65 liters of just extra air being crammed in there at a high speed. So that enables it to crank out a ridiculous amount of power. Unlike a lot of supercharged engines though, it also does rev really high. This guy goes up to 7,500 RPM. This guy is the first one of Ford's cars to use this new seven speed dual clutch transmission. And obviously Ford is not really known for doing dual clutch transmissions, but they knocked it out of the freaking park with this one. This thing is practically as good as the ones coming out of Porsche. It knows when to shift so intuitively that you can just leave it in automatic mode, whether you're on the track or on the street or on the highway, but it's also obviously got these really sweet metal paddle shifters right here behind the wheel. Ooh. These are actually, as far as I can tell, the same ones from the F-150 Raptor. They took the shifter out of a Ford Fusion, which is kind of lame here, but you press the little M in the middle, and then I can paddle through here and Give it the beans a little bit. But just the acceleration on this car is just, it's stupendous. Like it just starts picking up speed and just keeps on going and going and going. Now it's not the lightest car, weighs in about 4,200 pounds. But again, with this amount of power, you really don't notice, care at all, because it's just so stinking fast. Ford actually limited this thing to 180 miles an hour which seems really dumb to me because I guarantee this thing could hit 200 if you had enough room and they didn't have that governor on there. It's got magnetic dampers, just like the Chevy does, also just like Cadillacs and Ferraris do, which is just one of the best sort of suspension technologies on the planet when it comes to having a nice ride handling balance. This thing, it just soaks up the bumps really well, at least for a car of this level of performance. But at the same time, it just tracks and grips so well. The steering is delightful. It's got just as much feedback as you want really in a muscle car. Obviously, most cars nowadays, you want a little more feedback than they really serve up. But for what it is, it's delightful steering. Very pointy, gives you exactly what you want. You can just stick it anywhere you want to, just like beep, 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 beep. So much fun too, if you want to like turn off the traction control and do donuts and hoon around. but also just a really good everyday car. It's good on the track, it's good on the open road, it's good on the highway. It's kind of the perfect car if you don't need a usable back seat. 
I mean, I'm just using it to keep a hat back there. Well, we're here in Needles, Arizona, where we've stopped to refuel our cars because these cars drink a prodigious amount of gas. So uh, we're going to give them a little bit more fuel here. We're going to point at the engine and look manly and kind of express ourselves through manly ways. I got a custom vanity plate for my dog. So Arizona's pretty cool. <laughs> I thought that this was a halo. That's kind of weird and deceiving. No, it's just a... I know, but that's, yeah, that's weird. Yeah. No. That's it's pretty fun. weird. Did you see the flow tie, though? See, it's a pass-through so your air can flow through it. Flow tie. Not a bow tie. It's a flow tie. I'm hoping that we see some sights. Maybe try and not hit any burrows along the way. And more importantly, have fun out there. So, we are in the Camaro ZL1. This has the LT4 supercharged engine that's good for 650 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque. This does have a six-speed manual transmission, which is pretty awesome. It's the lightest out of all three. It comes in under 4,000 pounds. I think it's like 38 something, 3820. There's seven different options for traction control. Once you double tap the traction control button, you can cycle through wet, dry, sport one, sport two, race one, race two. So there's, there's a ton of fun to be had in this thing. Plus, it just gets a little slippy if you just leave it in track mode. It's just a little bit slippy as you step on it. The back end will step out just a little bit. That's super satisfying. The seats are extremely comfortable. It's got an Alcantara wrapped wheel, which is great if you're really cooking it and your hands start to get a little sweaty. It's definitely a fabric that you want so you can have some nice grip. The dashboard is a little spartan. All of the buttons are actually down here. One of the things that I don't like is the fact that they didn't put any of the vents up here. So the touch screen is center, which is nice for the convenience of actually touching it, but your hand gets a little cold, especially when it's hot out and you've got the air conditioning blowing down here. This thing has a ton of power. It pulls all the way through its 6500 red line and it feels great when you punch it. It sounds awesome. When you step on it, you get a little bit of a hint of supercharger wine. You obviously get the great exhaust note coming from the back. Another cool thing that the Camaro has, given that it's a manual, you'll notice that it has paddles up here. These are for rev match. So once you engage rev match, the gear that you're in, it shows up in yellow to confirm that you're in rev match. And then when you need to downshift, it'll blip shift for you to make sure that you're automatically at the right engine speed. So you're sitting very low, and out here in truck country, a lot of the headlights will pop directly from the side mirror into your eyes. So they've done a nice feature in this mirror only that reduces the amount of glare that's bouncing off of you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the 2020 Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye Wide Body. The Red Eye part of the name means this makes 797 horsepower, and the Wide Body part of the name means there's about three and a half inches more width from the fender flares compared to the typical Hellcat. It adds a stylish, athletic, almost mean stance to a car that's already great looking. <laughs> it brings me deep joy. It's a very like a wild, raw car. It's like, you know, and so it feels great to go fast on a line. It feels very comfortable, very stable. You go 100 without even knowing direct. The steering gets loose and you, you just relax into it. The car doesn't feel like
like it really kind of like sits down and grips the road as much as it propels like a rocket ship. Everything seemed to be going along swimmingly. Until halfway through Arizona on Route 66, we came across something unexpected. Whoa! Uh, there's a donkey. There is a donkey. <laughs> Hello. O okay, say hi to your mother for me. Hey buddy, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? All right, bye buddy. What a funky town. Oatman, Arizona is a little tourist trap of a town with one big draw, a giant herd of donkeys that basically has the run of the place. Hello. Hello. Our attempts at conversation rebuffed, we jumped back on the road. The West is awful big, after all, and we still had hundreds of miles to ride. I have to say that I think I've been getting more looks at my car than anybody else, you know, just, just saying. That's because it's colored like a Skittle. A delicious Skittle, yeah. Does anyone know what city or state we are in? We are now in Mojave Valley, Arizona, according to my GPS. So we've done about 350 miles at this point, correct? That's correct, yeah. How did you guys feel about the drive yesterday, apart from the soul-crushing traffic? I think the middle of the night was the best, when there's nobody around and you can, uh, you can go a little bit quicker than the speed limit. Yeah, that was nice. That was a little stretch there uh, out between where we can't say and where we can't say because we don't want other people to know where we speed. I love the way this car feels between about 80 and 105. It's so stable. It loves being on a straight line and accelerating that. It's very comfortable there. Wait, are you saying that it can turn? <laughs> I didn't mention the turning yet. So, middle of the night, we're cooking it. There were some bends in the road. How did you handle those? That was, it was honestly horrible. It was an adjustment. I got it, but like there was a solid 30 minutes of, uh, you know, or 20 minutes of like adjustment period, just understanding the way this thing moves, you know, like markedly different than what I'm guessing Will's car feels like. Was it sliding through the corners? I'm too important to die, so I was taking it easy. This thing didn't, I mean, I thought, I, I, I tried a, a brush of the brakes, then I tried uh, a lift, and then I realized that you can kind of just go flat out in all of those corners in this thing. Are you excited for Vegas? It feels like a fitting destination. When I told somebody where I'm going, I said, I say LA to Utah to Vegas. That, that makes the most sense to me when you talk about the trip. is your heated steering wheel? How warm are your hands? My hands right now are uh, actually quite comfortably warm uh, because it's now the middle of the day. I will admit they were a little chilly earlier, but you know what? I'm okay with that because like, I may not have a heated seats or a heated steering wheel, but I have the best car by far because this car is basically just a supercar that was made by Ford. So, end of discussion. That's sad that you don't have as much torque as I do. You may have more horsepower, but you also have an extra 450 pounds. Yeah, but you know what? Horsepower is what wins races, so I'm okay with that because I'm still going to whoop your car's butt every single time. Mm, no, you're two-tenths of a quicker uh, to the sprint to 60 and maybe 
one second, but uh, that thing has no soul and it has a plastic interior. Speaking of soul, I, I think I'm the only one with the, you know, this is this is the true muscle car here. You guys are like a version of a sports car. I feel, I feel this is the true soul of muscle. That's like the redneck Learjet, what you're driving right now. I mean, it's like, sure, it's great in a straight line, but is that thing any fun? I think it's very fun. I think you mispronounced scary. I haven't, uh, haven't gone off the road yet, into zero fences so far. The day is young, hold on. Yeah, most of these roads are straight, that's why. I will admit, I am a little bit jealous of uh, Hayden's sunroof, because I really have been a few times today where I've just wanted to like throw my hands in the air like I just don't care, and I haven't been able to. I'm just, I got nothing here. I'm jealous of three things about the Challenger. I'm jealous of the design, the overall exterior aesthetic, the fact that there's a sunroof, and the fact that it has a superior sound system. Everything else on that car is not great. I will give it also, I think it has the best infotainment system. Like the FCA does a pretty good job with that and that you connecting. And just like the way the controls are laid out, I think it's probably just the most user friendly of the three. John, your car is just, it's just so ugly. Like I just, I have to look at it here in my rear view mirror because of course that's where the Camaro would be. And it's just stunningly ugly. Sorry, it's taking me a second uh, to get back to the mic because I actually have a manual like uh, like these cars are supposed to have. So I've got to put the the radio down, shift my car like a like an actual person driving, and then pick the the radio back up. You know what? I would have once upon a time like actually taken offense to that because that would have cut a little close to the bone. But the dual clutch transmission that this Ford has is just so good that that just bounces off me. Like I'm just rubber and you're glue. And I feel so good about the transmission in this car that you, I, I don't care. It's that good. It's like Porsche good. They spend all of the money on the transmission. And the other, the other thing that's uh, bouncing off of you is the plastic in the interior. That is, uh, that's where all of the, the money came from when it went into your transmission. Yes, but at least like I can look at things beyond the plastic in the interior because I can actually see out of my car. I'm the only one who has an awesome rear camera that shoots 270 degrees, so I can see both of my blind spots. Can you? You have pretty big C-pillars. I know how to adjust my mirrors so I don't have blind spots, and also I have blind spot detection. And so does this. All right, so just, I mean, to go back to the horsepower discussion for a second here. So I have 760 horsepower. Sean, how many does your car have again? I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. Well, my car that's 400 plus pounds lighter than yours has 650, but it also has 650 pound feet of torque to your 500 and, 500 and what? Mine's actually 625, thank you very much. Oh, so just 25 less than mine, got it. have 717 horsepower, you actually have 797. So like you've got the most by far, but you also have just such a way bigger car. Yeah, I can feel it. The, the power feels endless. I really, I truly, I haven't found the bottom. I just, it just keeps going and going. I can just pump it as hard as I want. Uh, the only downside is, you know, doesn't feel as stable on the brakes and on the handling as maybe you guys have. By the way, because I was thinking about whether your car would be sort of like the best long-term, like long-distance cruiser here. In terms of like, if you were gonna break all three of these muscle cars down and sort of push them in different directions in terms of like what categories they overlap with, I feel like this one to me feels the most like it's basically a borderline supercar. The Camaro, I think, while it's obviously the performance is very close, it feels just more like a legit taut sports car to me. Whereas yours, I guess, would be more of like the Gran Turismo, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. It actually feels pretty appropriate for this drive we've been doing. Like, like passing people is like, you, you don't even think about it. You just like barely tap and you're gone. I'm pretty comfortable. You know, like we said, the, the infotainment is all really dialed in. It's, uh, you know, this is, I think, among the most comfortable for covering the, the you know, 2,000 miles that we're doing or whatever it is. 
supercar for any of these is a stretch. Sorry. You have a nicer muscle car, sort of. You at least have more per maybe more performance, although you have no torque, Will, once you get into a higher gear. And uh, I really can't get past, like, the cheapness of that interior, which, you know, again, I also think disqualifies it as a supercar. First of all, I've been in plenty of supercars that have crap-ass interiors, so that does not disqualify you at all from being a supercar. Second of all, for the amount of money that you actually spend on this, I would say it's very much a borderline supercar. In terms of how much this thing costs, this is absolutely like a bargain basement supercar. Uh, this thing starts at 70 grand. It's 80 grand as tested. I mean, you can spec it up a little bit more, but basically fully loaded, this thing doesn't even crack 100 grand. And it'll keep up with Porsches and Ferraris on a track that costs three times as much. And this thing will keep up with that. I'll still beat you, bro. You're spending all that time, you know, just moving your le your hand around. I just got to do this. Watch this. Sixth gear, fifth gear, fourth gear. Boom. That's how easy it was for me to shift. I just went down three gears in a half a second. Sean, how much is your car, by the way? Sixty-four thousand, fifteen thousand cheaper. The fact that this has torque that is punchy in every gear, and the Mustang does not gives it like more of a fun, nimbly feeling. And that's kind of what I look for. It's got really dialed in steering and you know, it stiffens up nicely in all the modes. It's got all the different handling ESC modes. Like there's a lot of tech in here for $64,000. That's just frankly not on either of your cars. Are you high? Look, I know we went through California before, but are you high? This car is so jam packed with tech, including a lot of the stuff that your car has. And a lot of stuff it doesn't. I have performance driving modes too. I have a magnetic ride suspension too. I have a supercharged V8 as well. I have launch control. I have line lock. Oh, and did I mention again the kick ass dual clutch transmission I have that shifts way faster and is way more intuitive than that old rope a dope stick you've got? Yeah, but I have 15,000 more dollars. Yeah, and I think I have more power than all of you guys. I'm a little more versatile. You can take this thing around the city. I did fine in the four hours of LA traffic we sat in. And while we're here, I would like to lodge a complaint about the Challenger headroom. That's about the only uncomfortable thing about this car. It, it's pretty comfortable. You know, uh, headroom for a 6'3 guy, not quite enough. Will, how do your legs feel with those seat bolsters? I got used to it, to be honest. Like in the long runs a little bit, they, uh, they do sort of wedge into my sides a bit, but that's also because I just have enormously long legs. I've been in worse cars. I can live with it. Generally speaking though, I do think it's worth sort of noting that like... Because we're all tall guys. We're all 6'2", 6'3", 6'4". Uh, and you know, sure there's a little quibble, maybe a little bit of headroom issues, maybe a little bit of sort of like uh, pushing on the sides from the seats. But generally speaking, I mean, these are very comfortable cars for big people on these long hauls. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I would agree with that. It hasn't been too problematic. It could definitely be worse. They're surprisingly usable cars, given this level of performance. Like, you know, we we joke about it, sure, but like, you know, with considering the level of cars that you'd have to go to to beat these on a track, in the case of Sean's car and my car, like these are really usable by comparison. They've got token rear seats. You know, they've got big roomy interiors. They've got pretty decent stereos. Like there's, you know, everything here is like in a big trunk too, which is very much underrated if you're gonna be taking these long trips. So far, car is aside, how are you guys feeling about this trip? Very excited to try the sodas. Yes, I, I'm also excited for these sodas. Did we get 12? I can't remember. I do believe we've got a baker's dozen of the sodas. We've got a uh, Lester's Fixin' Ranch Dressin' Soda. Y'all get your fixins. God. <laughs> I think the trip, you know, the first day was a little tough. We had traffic. We had a slow, late crawl into Nevada. We've been driving for like two hours now and we've gone like 40 miles. Plus. Because California, <laughs> because California is terrible. This is a horrible place and I don't know why people live here. But uh, last night and this morning were surreal. Monument Valley was completely surreal. No, I definitely think Monument Valley by far, like one of the 10 most beautiful places I've ever seen. Like not even exaggerating, especially just like Going, seeing it at sundown, seeing it at sunrise, 
it's just like I don't like to use the word epic too much because it's really cliche but that was kind of epic I just really like all of the roads out here I mean except for some of the stretches in Arizona they're mostly really well maintained you have incredible sight lines they're kind of perfect for high horsepower cars they're definitely perfect for a challenger because there's not a lot of turning yes yes yeah, and it's, I mean, we've definitely been exceeding the speed limit by a uh, little bit on some of these roads out here, but there's just, with those sight lines and the gentle curves and all that stuff like that, you really can just go so freaking fast and feel safe and comfortable doing it, especially in these cars. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely feel like, I mean, here it is, it's the year 2020, I feel like in 10 years, we're not gonna be able to do this road trip again with this sort of brand new muscle cars packing this level of power. I mean, just, I mean, you know, it's, you think about how the world is changing and stuff like that. These cars have 22 horsepower combined between them. I, I absolutely had that thought yesterday, sitting at the top of that hill in Monument Valley, about to drive down into the straight, thinking, you'll probably never do this again. I would enjoy it. I don't know, Ford didn't trim out muscle and sports cars when they were trimming sedans and neither did GM. I still think that there's still a market. I still think this stuff will be around. I think we'll be passing a lot more Teslas, uh, although some of them may be on the back of trailers as, they, as the one we saw yesterday. But I still think in 10 years you'll be able to do this. I just don't think the cars will be quite this wild and raw and pure. Like I think there, was, there definitely will still be a Mustang in 10 years from now, but you know, it's it might be electric. Certainly there'll be an electric Mustang SUV at that point. You know, the Challenger is 15 years old and, you know, they don't seem to have any plans to make a new one. At least as far as we know, they're not talking about it. And the Camaro sales have been flagging. So there's, you know, people are talking about how it may not last past like 2023. I think there will still be some version of these nameplates around in 10 years. But I think the idea that it's just this raw, purely internal combustion car making 650, 750, 800 horsepower I think this is get, like we're basically at the tail end of it. We're, I feel like we're in the we're the dinosaurs right now, and we're wondering what that big bright light up in the sky is. Well, I'm kind of with you. It's funny to feel the looks and the way you get. Of course, there's the impressed old men, the inquisitive, you know, uh, you know, restaurant workers or gas station clerks. But I also feel a healthy amount of side eye. These aren't exactly, you know, maybe in vogue at the moment. I, I think, I mean, look, all the jacked trucks rolling coal around here, like, uh, you know, I, this isn't necessarily a very eco-friendly part of the, the country. Like, there's, there's a lot of guys and a lot of drivers in this region who still appreciate combustion engines and, and big and high horsepower numbers. No, for sure. But, like, look, in terms, A, people like pickup trucks in part because they're even more utilitarian. Like, even a jacked-up bro truck... You know, you can take it off road. You can lug shit in it if you want to. You know, these cars are, they have a very specific brief and that is to go fast and burn rubber. But I think also the thing is like, look, people are, you know, like you said, pickup truck drivers, they love power. And we're already seeing sort of this like burgeoning move into making electric pickup trucks because on numbers, they can win. CMC is announcing their Hummer pickup truck. It has a thousand horsepower. And 11,000 pound feet of torque at the wheels. It's just like, you know, in terms of the numbers, in terms of the raw stump pulling torque, electric trucks are going to win. Electric's going to win every time in the end for that. Electric only accounts for less than 3% of vehicles sold. And even if that doubles in the next like couple of years, then you're still at 6%. I just, I don't see it dropping off. I don't see combustion, specifically like these cars, dropping off as, as precipitously as you do. I mean, it's, I think, again, I, I think there will always be some version of it. Maybe it'll be a hybrid version. Maybe it'll be all electric or something like that. But I think that, you know, the days of these sorts of cars, as the, we're driving them right now, I think they're numbered. But if the beauty of the West is to survive, cars like these may well need to die. Climate change is affecting the West as much as it is anywhere else, after all. And these muscle cars are hardly eco-friendly. Over the course of our roughly 1,500 miles of driving, our trio of cars burned more than 300 gallons of gasoline. That means we added three tons of CO2 to the atmosphere in four days. For comparison, the average American creates 16 tons of CO2 per year. 
One day, perhaps sooner than we imagine, electric cars will be the ones racing along under these western skies. They may be faster and even more fun than these cars. They'll certainly be better for the winds and the waters, but the canyons will no longer echo with the roar of their engines. Just like the cowboys, they'll be left to legend.